All right, I think we are now recording. So I am here with Martin. Uh, Martin's from the Boston area, and we're going to spend a little time talking about some different topics here. Um, we, we talked ahead of time about some of the topics you want to talk about. One of the things you were talking about was exposure modes and methods. Um, and I think your, your struggle has been getting the proper exposure uh, for the images straight out of camera. Correct. Yep. Okay. Um, first question right off the bat, are you shooting raw or JPEG? Raw. No. Raw. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so I don't have to hang up on you now. <laughs> um, so exposure modes are an interesting thing. I think anytime, you know, people joke about shooting in P for professional, right? Let the camera do any, everything on its own. I'm not a big subscriber to that. Um, I know it's the easiest way for a lot of people to do things, but what I find is generally speaking, it slows my shutter down to the point where I end up with, with motion blur in my pictures. So I don't really ever go there. Um, what I find is I basically balance between three different modes and I'm shooting uh, shutter priority TV on a Canon uh, anytime I'm doing sports or wildlife. I do an aperture priority AV anytime I'm shooting naturally lit portraits and I'm shooting manual anytime I'm shooting with any sort of lighting whatsoever. Um, I will often when I'm shooting the sports or I'm shooting naturally lit, I'll let the, the ISO go auto and that sort of becomes my big variable in there. Because if I'm shooting shutter priority, it's gonna pretty much drop it to my widest aperture. So right. 70 to 200, it's gonna be a 2.8. And then that variability in the exposure is gonna come from the auto ISO. Um, you just wanna make sure that that exposure comp compensation dial is set right in the middle or you know, adjust that with purpose. Um, sometimes you may want to overexpose a little bit if you have a backlit subject so it brings their face up a little brighter, washes out the background, or vice versa sometimes. But, so I was told always, I was told shoot manual. manual so, you manual. know. So I've always been scared to go back to AV or TV on my Canon. You know, sometimes yeah. the, they get, they're getting so good now. Um, you know, like, so you're shooting with a 5D Mark IV. Correct. Um, I'm shooting with the R5 and R6. The exposure on these things, as they, as the camera decides to do it, sometimes is so darn good that I really can't argue with it. Hmm. Um, you know, but that said, certainly I do shoot manual a lot, and it, and sometimes the creativity that I want to get into an image, I have to shoot manual. And if I'm going to shoot manual, but I don't want to think about my end exposure shot by shot by shot. Then sometimes I will switch into manual. I'll set my shutter speed. I'll shut shut my aperture, and then I'll let ISO go auto. So that will sort of take that ebb and flow of lighting conditions. It just gets hard to chase it sometimes, you know. Especially right. if you're shooting outdoors, clouds come in, they go away, or you know, you're shooting a sporting event outdoors at night. The light is fading. You don't want to necessarily. If you spend all your time focused on chasing the right exposure you may miss the action shot that you want to get in the long run. And it's better to get the shot and let some of those things go automatic for you. That's, that's sort of always been my philosophy. Now I know there are photographers out there that would probably just keel over in their graves right now, hearing me say that, but um, you know, yeah, generally speaking, that's what I'm going to do. So, you know, sports photography, I'm going to set my, my shutter speed. So I'm going to freeze the action. So when you say sports photography, you mean any kind of sports from gymnastics to tennis to exactly. slower sports, faster sports. Yep. Off, and then the, only, the only difference is now where I set that shutter speed is going to be based on how fast that action is. Right. right. So if I'm, if I'm trying to shoot a high speed thing like figure skating, ice hockey, uh, football, track, I'm going to try and get that up faster a daylight outdoor event, I'm probably going to shoot at a one thousandth or one two thousandth of a second. Um, indoor, I'm going to try and get as fast as I can without going really too high on the ISO. So I'm going to try and shoot for about a 400 to a 500th of a second. Um, but that, that can be tricky sometimes. And sometimes these gyms are really dark. Um, you know, so I kind of gauge it on how fast the sport is. Uh, and sometimes though, you want to you really drag that shutter 
for like a panning shot. So like motorsports, if you shoot a Indy car at one eight thousandth of a second, it just looks like it's parked in a parking lot. If you can shoot that at one twentieth of a second, dragging the, the camera along with it, you'll get that motion blur of the tires, the motion blur of the background. So that's kind of your creativity in sports is how much of that delay do you want? And I've, I've shot some things like uh, motorsports and cycling and things like that, where I've tracked with the subject, freezed them with the motion of the camera and let everything else go blurry, shooting down into the 20th of a second kind of range. So, so that's- the athlete, kind of, Yeah, the athlete in is perfect, but the, the blur is on the, on the exactly. bike. Exactly, yeah, yeah. Um, so, so now we'll switch mindset and we'll say, I'm gonna shoot portraiture, I'm gonna shoot people, I'm gonna shoot a group, and I'm gonna shoot outdoors in natural light. So I'm not using the strobe, I'm not using any flash at all. And I'm just sort of positioning someone in a nice light. I'm getting them into a, into a place where, you know, maybe they're in like a covered shade. So they're shaded, but then there's a bright sun that's reflecting off of things and bouncing in on them. You'll get a really nice light that way. In a case like that, I'm going to generally always shoot in aperture priority because now my creativity is going to be my depth of field. Do I want to capture just my subject and have everything else that silky bokeh in the background? Or do I want to have, you know, looking at my subject and the people who are sort of staged behind, I may have to move that, that aperture a little tighter, bring it up to f5.6 or even f8 to try and get some more people into that, into that depth of field. Um, on a wedding day, typically, I'm, I'm going for the shallowest depth of field I can possibly get. So I'm shooting the, the bride and groom dancing their first dance. I'm going to use my 85. I'm going to set it down to 1.4 and I'm going to, I'm going to focus on just the bride with the groom being, you know, blurred out in the foreground or vice versa. And that ends up being for a really nice shot. Um, you know, I, I find a lot of times wedding days, I'm always shooting, you know, you know wide open. If it's the 70, 200, the 85, um, you know, I've got uh, the, there's a new one for the R series, the 28 to, to 70 2.0 taking it right down to 2.0 and it just gives such an beautiful, beautiful blurred background. So, um, you know, in that kind of case, my, I'm, my creative choice is my depth of field and I kind of let everything else, you know, shake out where it, where it lays. That said, shooting dancing on the dance floor at, at the night of a wedding, they're moving a lot. They're going quickly. So at that point I may switch back over to manual because I know I want the shallow depth of field, but I also need to make sure that I have people somewhat frozen in action. So I'll, move, I'll go to manual, 200 on the shutter or 320 on the shutter, wide open aperture, and then auto ISO to, to get the ambient light right in the room. So now it's, dark, now it's dark as well, right? So I mean, what do you use for light? Just the light Yeah, the so, so the way that we shoot a wedding because it's my wife and I doing it, she shoots with flash on all the time, on camera flash bouncing off the ceiling. Yep. And I shoot natural light all the time. So we give two totally different looks. And then it, it makes for a really nice mix in the album because you can have a page where it goes all naturally lit with the warm, you know, natural colors. And then you can have some that had more of the, well, you know, the, the lighting effects and the, you know, the, the brighter whites and everything. So, um, you know, it's just kind of a mix of, and gives people options. But, um, so then if we're talking about anything that where I am lighting, then I'm going manual always. Um, if I'm using a TTL flash, I'll let that be my, my variable, my wild card. So I'll, you know, maybe on camera flash with a bounce off the ceiling or off the wall, I'll set my, my, the fastest shutter I can. I, with a flash, I always go to 200 on my camera. Um, I'll set my aperture for the depth of field that I want. And then I'll set my ISO as low as I reasonably can. So if I'm using studio strobes, it would be a hundred. Um, if I'm doing a bounce flash at a wedding, it could be, you know, anywhere in the range, really, just depending on how much that flash can accommodate. And then I'm letting the flash go TTL. So, um, it's, you know, through the lens metering. So basically it's going out doing a pre-flash 
determining what the right flash amount should be, and then flashing and taking the picture. So you get. So, can you, can you, so when you do a waiting or something, can you tell? What I struggle with is when it's like night and stuff. If I don't have a flash, whatever I do, it comes out dark, like too dark. Yeah. So how do you know so, when you need a flash and when's the borderline between the two of going from flash to no flash? You know what I'm saying? Like I was so, taking three pictures, it got dark fast, and suddenly everything was just like dark. It was right. Dark. And you're probably getting proper exposure on you may be getting proper exposure on your subject, right? But then everything around is dark. So you want to look at your metering mode on your camera. So you might be using like a spot metering mode. Okay. So spot metering mode is going to look at that center point on your camera. It's going to look at that subject and it's going to make sure that that center point is exposed properly. If you set it to a valuative, it looks at the whole scene and it tries to compensate for everything. But keep in mind, a on-camera flash with a bounce is not going to be able to light up a room. It's just going to be able to light up your subject. So if your room is dark, start raising your, your ISO until you get a proper exposure and then now the flash will illuminate them. Um, what I'll do with that sometimes is I'll actually, I'll turn the flash off. I'll take a picture of the room, adjust it so I like how the room looks and then I'll turn the flash back on TTL and then I'll shoot the subject. So it gives you kind so of you that. Put, are you put are you practicing? Are you taking practice shots? Prior, are you taking practice shots prior to everything, making sure, and then looking, and then making sure, and then taking the pictures? Or are you really just doing it on the fly. Then... So, you know, yeah. here, here it is—the first dance. If I'm going to use flash for the first dance, because maybe it's a really dark room or something like that, I'm going to take a shot, see where I stand. Oh, I need—I need to raise my ISO some. I bring that up. I take another one. Okay, now I've got the room, I can see people in the background. I've got a decent kind of composition. Then I flip on the flash and the flash will then illuminate my subject perfectly. So that's kind of kind of the mix. Um, you can do that quickly. You know, I mean, if you think about it, you hear, okay, we're gonna have the dance, boom, boom. Okay, flip on the flash and now I go. So I really only spent 10 seconds and the song is four minutes long. Okay or 15 right. minutes long in some weddings, you never know. <laughs> oh, you, have, you have time to go back and forth, uh, fair enough. You have yeah. time to go back and forth and make sure. Very cool. Yeah, right. yep. Um, so that kind of brings me to another thing I wanted to talk to you about. Uh, so let, let's jump over to that. I'm going to share with you right now, Lightroom, and we're gonna go over here. So, have you ever heard of the concept of the inverse square law? That's frightening. Um, it's not frightening. It. You're an engineer. I know. <laughs> I've heard about it, and everyone thinks it's so frightening, but honestly, I haven't, heard, I haven't it, really delved so into it, it much. It's pretty straightforward. So let me give you the thumbnail view of it here. Basically, what it's saying is, to look at how the light will fall off, how much less light will be on your subject if a light is fixed. So you just sort of set your light to, you use your light meter, you set it to F8, let's say. One meter away from that light, you measure it's, it's F8. So at one meter, you calculate your lighting and you say one over one squared, because it's one meter. So I'm getting 100% of my light right there, or basically a lighting effect of one, we'll say, for this argument. If I move to two meters away, now my light would be one over two squared or one quarter of the light that I got at one meter, and so on and so forth. So if you can see these, these numbers on here, um, you know, as you work farther away, two meters, three meters, four meters, five meters, that light gets less and less and less, and it's in this in this curve going off to when I get 10 meters away, now I'm at one one hundredth of the light. Okay. Where, and I'm gonna send you this, so you don't have to worry about writing this down. Okay. Where this gets interesting though, is when we get less than a meter. So now the effects, I've only graphed this to half a meter away because when I get to 0.1 meters away, the light is 100 times more intense than one meter away. So this effect, is is exponential or 
yeah, I think, or logarithmic. I don't know. It's been a long time since math classes um, as you get farther away. And so what this, what I want you to think about with this is intensity of photographs or more of a gentle lighting effect on photographs. So, and this is where you, you know, when you're looking at your, your team photos, your sports team photos that you're doing, like with the swimmers and things, this yeah. is what I want you to think about. And this is going to be the key to the whole thing. When I look at somebody and I want an intense photograph, I want that light as close to them as it can possibly be because you can get an image like this. Now, the light in this case was at about a 30 degree angle and it was nearly touching his shoulder and nearly touching the top of his head and just to his side. And because he's so close to that light, the fall off from 0.1 meters, which is 100x intensity, to his nose, which is four inches away. It, it, four inches away now, we're looking at, you know, in the ballpark of 16x the light. Right. So that, that differential as we go across there makes for a really dramatic, really strong kind of uh, intense portrait. When we look at your pictures in a little bit of your of your sports team guys, your swim team guys, you're going to see where you could take a technique like this, bringing that light in closer and making for a really intense picture. Now, alternatively, if you want to have something where, and, and so keep in mind, in this shot right here, he's standing about two feet in front of a, a white background and you oh. can't even see it. Right, absolutely. I because the Okay. Because of now that fall off of light, it's it's just completely gone by the time you get a meter away. Gotcha. All right. Makes sense. So if you want something where it's a little less intense, in a shot like this, the light is, well, you can just barely see it in the, in the right-hand edge of the picture, right by the backboard. You see a little bit of a triangle of light poking into the frame there. Yeah. Right at the edge. So the light here is about six feet away. So the light in this case is able to illuminate him and also some of the area around him. So the farther away you get the light, you get more of this disbursement of light. So if you want to light the background evenly with the subject, you need to move that light far enough away so that this differential is not that great. So if a light was four meters away from your subject and the background was another meter behind that, there's going to be no difference in that lighting between the two. Now that said, to be four meters away with a light, you need to have a big light source or it's going to be a very hard light source. So that's kind of where you can start playing some games here. And if you look at the difference between two meters and three meters, it's not that different. It's a quarter of the light or a ninth of the light, right? So um, you can work with this with the distance of the light to try and even things out some. Bring it in closer for more dramatic, more fall off across your subject. Bring it out for a more, you know, evenly lit subject and background and everything else. Wow. So if we go, we jump over to your pictures and I want to look at these guys right here. Um, so you did a, a, a group of swimmers, co collegiate swimmers doing some, some team photos for them. Um, the first one here does not have the, the, the retouching effects as the other three. So I'm starting with this one and I'm going to work through them in a progression. Um, but you, you can see when you look at it, I, as I look at this image, I see he's kind of flatly lit. So it seems like you probably had lights on both sides. Um, and they're about even in their, in their intensity. And I'm going to say they're probably three, four or five feet away because there's right. not a lot of fall off as you go across the subject. Right. Um, what that's going to do, because it's more evenly lit, is it's not going to intensify sort of the muscle tone. It, you're not going to see the rib cage as much. You're not going to see shadows as, as you go across his arms and things like that as much. Now, if you brought those two lights in and get them very close on either side, maybe a foot away on either side, it's going to give a much more intense kind of image, a much more dramatic kind of shot. So let me understand that. So if, so if I was six feet back, I have to bring them closer to the subjects. 
or yes. in more to a certain so in and closer in and closer yeah hmm. um so i wish you could see i can't really show what's around me right now but i've got these two um, maybe i can show it a little bit i've got these two lights here on either side of me they're they're three by four soft boxes that are that are looking at me and not that yep. i'm trying to get an intense image right now or anything but um <laughs> as I bring them in like that, that's very often how I'm going to shoot somebody in the, in the studio is I'm going to bring those lights in so that I, I have to take them out of every picture in Photoshop. Like their lights are in every picture, but it makes for a more dramatic image. And then working on lighting ratios, this one's twice as bright or three times as bright as this one, you'll get that nice three-dimensional effect as you go across. Now that said, I'm going to jump to this next one. Now, in this case, I think a, a bunch of this, I think it, I would guess it was lit in a similar kind of way. Yeah, it was. But, a, and it may just be the way that you've, you've um, done your edit on the image afterwards, but it makes for a much more dramatic shot, much more, the shadows are deeper, the highlights are brighter. It's, it's got this gritty feel, um, you know, and another one that's right here is a similar kind of thing, right? You've got that kind of gritty feel um, but the shot, the shot is this one right here. Um, this one I am jealous of. <laughs> that is a fantastic shot. Just the way you got imposed, the, 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 the tonality of his muscles, the way that you got the shadows and highlights done. That's a fantastic shot. I couldn't be happier for you to get one like that. Yeah, it happens so, once every moon, right? Yeah. 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 So, uh, but I think, you know, as you bring those lights in, so just keep that in mind, bringing them in as tight as you can, you're going to get that more dramatic kind of shot. It's going to make your background go away because now if you're illuminating on a closer field, you know, if we go back to, sorry to jump around on you here, but we go back here and we say, we're going to put that, that light modifier at a, a half a meter, a foot and a half away from your subject and your background is two meters away, well, that difference between 1.8 almost lighting at a, at a half meter, or I'm sorry, four X lighting at a half meter and a quarter lighting at two meters is a huge, huge difference. So you're gonna have a much more dramatic, bold shot and you don't have to worry so much about what's in your background. Another example of this for you is this one. So this shot was shot literally high noon, full sunlight, daylight. And what I did was I just turned my, I, well, I turned my, I'm gonna guess my aperture was probably about, yeah, 11. So it's one 200th of a second at F11, um, ISO 100. And I had the light modifier so that it was just about touching his shoulder at a slight angle coming down over the top of him. So you take this shot that ends up being a very dramatic shot. I mean, it's, I'm not saying it's one of my favorite ones ever by any means, but it's just one that I found, but a very dramatically lit shot. And it looks like it's he's being shot at night almost with like headlights on him, but it's That's it's cool. high noon, broad daylight. So, so let's, um, let's jump back over here. I wanna talk about some more of your pictures for you or with you. Um, so let's look at these because you wanted to talk about some off-camera lighting things um now i don't have i don't think this one had the full yeah i don't have all of this oh i do have the settings there's f 5.6 okay um so the first thing i would say to you is anytime you're going to use your flash you want to keep in mind that the flash itself is being your shutter so the shutter speed when you're using flash doesn't usually really matter. Um, the shutter opens up for, in this case, 1 80th of a second. But because you're at an 80th of a second and 5.6, not that much light is coming in. The flash is going to fire for a very short duration. So a lot of the flashes, like if I'm looking at your, uh, your Flashpoint Explore 600, you're probably flash duration is like one sixteen thousandth of a second or something so that flash duration is what's actually controlling the length of your exposure not how long your shutter is open for hmm. so anytime you're going to use flash i would always put it right up to one two hundredth of a second 
like immediately. Don't even, don't even think about it because that's going to give you a little bit more control of your ambient. What your, what your shutter duration will do when you're using flash is, is control the ambient light in the background. So in this case, what I, <clears throat> I like the shot. You can see it. I mean, there's a great connection between them. The smiles are great, but what I, what I get drawn to is the background being brighter. And it's, yeah. it's a little bit on the distracting side. You know, they always say that the first thing that will draw your eye to the picture is the brightest portion of the photo. And so when I bring this photo up, the first thing that I see is the left-hand side of the image where it's the brightest point of the image. And then now that I do draw my eye across and I, I see the girls, but it's a little bit on the distracting side to me. So I think with a shot like this, had you shot at one two hundredth, that background would have been a little darker and I would pull them forward off of that. Now, I don't know what room you're in, so you may not have a lot of space to do that. Right. But the more you pull them forward off of it, the darker that background will go. You also won't see any, the wrinkles as much. They'll be more faded with the depth of field. Um, yeah. I remember when I was shooting portraits early on, I always had people way too close to the background and then I would spend hours Photoshopping out wrinkles. And so now I try yeah. and bring them as far forward as I can and still be able to get them in frame. Um, so how, far, how, far forward, how far forward is a uh, rule of thumb, in your opinion? Well, so it kind of depends on, on your lens choice and everything. So you're using the 24 to 72, eight here. Um, that's going to be a fairly, a fairly wide depth of field. Anyway, that, that lens will give you a fairly wide depth of field, even at 2.8. Um, the longer the lens, the 70 to 200, um, you know, if you were to shoot a portrait with a 400 millimeter lens, it's going to compress that background down behind you. And it's, it's going to give you a shallower depth of field because you're now farther back and it's going to make the, the background go away a little bit more. Interesting experiment for you to try sometime would be to take your, your 24 to 70 and your 70 to 200, have your daughter stand there. And then basically start down at the 24 end and take a photograph of her where her, her head is, you know, let's say, you know, in the, the top half of the frame. All right, so she's about the same size. And then zoom in to around 50 and then back up so that her head is the same size in frame and then keep going. And this is with some, you know, maybe woods in the background or the house in the background or something. And then get to your 70, then switch to your 70 to 200 and work your way up to 100 and then 150. And then finally shoot at 200 with her head being the same size. So now you have backed up and backed up and backed up the difference in that background you'll find dramatic. It will compress that background in the, the wide angle 24 shot. You're going to see if it's the house, for example, you'll see the whole house in the background. When you get done, you're going to see a little tiny portion of siding at 200. And it's, it's going to give a very, very different look. So choosing that, choosing the right tool to get the right kind of background can save you a lot of trouble in cutting out, you know, distractions in the image. Um, but it will also, do a really nice job of maybe tailoring that background and giving a kind of look that's more interesting, taking away, you know, things around it. Now that said, sometimes you want all of that. Right. You know, we have a, a locally, there's a, a, a bridge that we like to shoot on down in Binghamton. And what's fun about the pictures is all of that, the steel of the bridge, you know, it's a, a suspension bridge with all these things above. And you want to shoot wide because you want that whole look around you. If you shoot it at 200, well, now all you see is the person and the traffic light at the other end of the bridge. And it's not a very interesting shot. So right. it's kind of a, again, it's kind of a creative decision, but that focal length can really change how it looks. In this case, I would be tempted to pull them uh, several feet forward, if you can, in the room, and then take that and shoot more in your 70 range, you know, back that up a little bit, shoot more at 70, even switch to 70 to 200 and shoot it at 85 ish or shoot with your 85 even. Um, you'll get that kind of shot. You'll get that kind of look, but you won't have so much of the background showing and the background will darken because your lights are now illuminating them and not, not the background so much. All right. So, so if I move them forward, it takes away the shadows from the back as well, I assume, right? Yeah. And the lights stay where they are or the lights come closer? 
the lights would move forward. right with them, move them in, oh, okay. in pair. So, yeah. So they, if they come three feet forward, move the, the lights three foot back. Exactly. Yep. Gotcha. Okay. Yep. Now, this one's an interesting one too. <clears throat> so it says that you did fire lights. So where did you have a light in this one? I thought it was just a on flash. Okay. So just going right at them. It's a while back. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, so shooting groups is a tricky one because unless you've got a lot of lights in the mix or you're doing an on camera, just straight on flash and with a wide spread, it's hard to illuminate everybody. Um, yeah. now clearly it's a daytime shot, so you don't need a lot of fill. You don't need a lot of light on them, but it, it can help. And it can also help lower your ISO. So you don't have as much grain in your image. So it is handy to have the flash there. Um, one thing I really don't want to do to you is tell you, you have to go buy a whole bunch of gear. Like that's not what this is about. <laughs> um, but that. I, but I do have a recommendation for you. Um, and so if you're going to be shooting where you're going to have large groups like this, two things to, to look at. One would be stagger them. So bring every other couple down a step or even two steps so that you bring the people in closer together and have a little bit more verticality in the image. And that will give a little bit more interest. So when everybody's kind of in a line, it looks like they're lined up. But if you brought a couple down a step, another couple down two steps and kind of stagger and make triangles of couples, um, it can make for a really nice look. On the gear side of things, if you're gonna illuminate a group like this, one thing that's really nice to do with your off-camera flash. So again, this would be using like your Explorer 600. You want the, the big horsepower for this is to use a very large reflective umbrella. And so what I mean by that is Westcott makes one that's fantastic. It's a seven foot uh, umbrella. So, I mean, this thing opens up, you, you can't use it in the house, it, it hits the ceiling. Yeah. Um, <laughs> But uh, it's a, you know, you can get it either white or silver on the inside, um, and it's it's just an umbrella, so it folds down really small. It pops up super quick, and because it's a seven foot thing, it's a very large light source. It makes for the it makes for beautiful, beautiful pictures. Really, um, you know, a really soft light, a very flattering light. Um, and I use this for, for groups all the time. I wasn't planning to show this one, but let me just bring it up really quick. Um, where am I going here? This one. So with this group here, this is what I, what I shot this with, is with that seven foot umbrella. Oh. So I, I took, I love this shot, the guy in the middle oh, yeah. in the back with the cowboy hat, he's just, yeah, he's, yeah. it's awesome. So I first got my exposure perfect for the clouds in the background. Yeah. And once I was happy with that exposure, now I start bringing in the groups, um, setting them all up. And then I have that big umbrella. It's off to camera right at this point, kind of a little bit high up. I probably had the stand up to about nine feet. So it's coming down on them um, and just illuminating everybody really nicely in a, and in a nice soft way. But it gives a good three dimensionality to it to have that additional light being brought in. Sure, I've lost you. I can't hear you anymore. Uh oh, frozen. Actually, I see you being frozen. Um, I can hear you, Martin. Oh, uh, are you came back? Yeah, okay. froze for froze. That's yeah, that's Zoom for you. Yeah, it froze for uh, ten seconds. Okay. All right. So, so you're saying, you're saying so where, is the light source always good to come down at the, the, the subjects in every circumstance almost? 30 degrees so, down. So, it kind of, so there's two ways to look at that. So the one thing you don't ever really want to do is have a light source coming up. So that, right. that gives you horror lighting, you know, like you look like you're yeah. Bella Lugosi in a horror movie. Right. Um, yeah. I always have it coming down. Now, sometimes it's fairly flat or sometimes it's a little bit up. Um, it's again, it's kind of a creative thing. What you'll find is the higher the light goes, the more shadow you'll have under the nose, the more shadow you'll have under the chin. That can be right. flattering in some cases, and it can be horrible with, in others. Like I am not a good one to have lighting 
coming too far down because then it shows all this double chin business down here. Um, but, uh, you know, so a, a more like a flat, a flat, I should get my yeah. hands more in the frame, flat on either side can be a very flattering light. Um, you know, and, and it sort of depends on your, on your subject, you know, like so do you need for big, so for big group, sorry, for a big group, do you need two lights in the same? So that one I showed you is just a single light. You know, a big seven foot's enough for. Yeah. The, yeah. the caution though, the thing that you really need to be aware, the yeah. bigger your modifier, the more wind it will catch. Oh, right. Right. So if you don't have, if you don't have an assistant to help you hold onto that stand, you could say goodbye. That thing is going to turn into Mary Poppins, and you're going to lose your light. So just, uh, just I, be I just cautious. bought a whole bunch of I bought a whole bunch of sandbags. So hopefully those things will. Yeah. So I've I, even with I had four sandbags on that one time, and it went over. So oh, that's I, a big, it's a big. Uh, yeah, it's a big. Yeah, that seven footer is a. It's something, uh, but it's such a gorgeous light, um, and you can you can even use that for a studio style portrait too. Again, it, it just wraps around so much. That big light source gives such a soft light. Uh, it's really quite nice. Awesome. Um, all right, so we are going to try and screen share again because I want to get to this other type of photo that you take. Um, so we're going to go back to Lightroom and I'm going to jump back into your shots and I want to talk about these. Oh, yeah. Um, so actually, I want to first, I want to jump to these shots. Now, I'm, my assumption is that, that these two are earlier in your career, or are they later? Uh, possibly later. I mean, okay. I cropped them completely. I mean, it's just... Okay. Um, I, the, the kid, I, I worry for that kid in the black headgear. I think the other one's about to take him down hard, but uh, <laughs> um, so as I look at these shots, I like the action. I like the moment that you caught. Um, same kind of thing over here. The fact that there's not a single foot on the ground in this image is fantastic. I mean, what a, what a great instant in time to get. I look right. at the next one in the series and there's only one foot on the ground out of, out of four, like that catching that moment is really, really great. And I think, um, you know, especially if there's a sport that you know and you you understand it's easier to catch those moments sometimes so clearly I, you know wrestling I, I you know, know what you're looking for um what what i don't like about these two yeah is the colors and the white balance seem very off to me yeah um you know they seem very like very orange um the colors on this one i think feel a lot more natural to me um you know these shots here i think they're yeah. they have the the right approach i'm going to hit you with one more piece of equipment that i think you may want to add to your to your repertoire um yeah. and that's this little guy here um so let me let me switch back so this is called a x-rite color checker passport you ever seen one of these i actually have one of them now so you have one I perfect Probably about six months ago, I bought one. So okay, so that's what oh, yeah. that's what you need. Um, so anytime I shoot in a gym, because the lighting is always so strange, first thing I always do is I shoot the gray card, on you know take a picture on the camera, and I do a custom white balance so that what I'm seeing in the camera on the back of the screen is relatively close to what it should be. Yeah. And then when I actually get in, you know, now I'm ready to go. Then I shoot, um, you know, I shoot this side. So, so explain to something to me then. So how do you shoot that? How do you shoot that kind of gray form? card? No, no, the gray card is fine because you can shoot it from. Do you actually hold yeah. it and shoot from here? Yeah, or, yeah, because it doesn't even matter if it's in focus, as long as the majority of the screen is that color, and you go into the camera and say create a custom white balance. Okay. It looks at your camera roll. It finds that shot. It goes make it from this, and yes. I meant um, the actual. I meant the the colorful one. The um. So the colorful the one. Checker. The only side that matters is this bottom portion here. Okay. This one is nice to have, but this bottom part is what it gets the the actual uh, profile from. Okay. So what I do is I, I make it into a tent. Yeah. Set it down on on the ground or on the bleachers. Okay. Right. And I shoot it. So you say the bleachers? Does it make a difference where you shoot it in the room, or is it just no? 
Oh, okay. No, I thought just... it was always next to the person's face or in the area. So shooting. if okay. I'm if I'm in the studio, I that's what I do. Yeah. Um, but yeah, if I'm if I'm in the bleachers or I'm in a gym, the lighting's going to be consistent throughout. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's funny. I did have as an example, I had this shot. Yeah. So this is you know at the beginning of a portrait session. I had a family that had. Um, <coughs> excuse me, skin tones. I wanted to make sure that I accurately represented. So I had them hold it up really quick. Um, give me just one second here. Yep, absolutely. We're good. <laughs> okay. Hey, you've been, you been talking almost for an hour without a break. It's natural for uh, one's throat to drive. So eventually, yeah. yeah. That's good. <clears throat> All right. So going back over here. Like this kid. I like the expression. <laughs> Again, I think the. The white balance is a little bit off. He looks a little pinkish, yeah. <clears throat> a little magenta. Um, nice shot. I like the composition. Um, <clears throat> definitely a good one for a panorama like that. Still keeping, you know, kind of a rule of thirds with the kids on the bottom. It's a that's a nice shot. This one concerns me a little bit. Oh yeah, I'm looking now. It does. Um, you know, certainly I would say it's it's overexposed maybe even close to a full stop over. Um, and I think this this kind of thing is where <clears throat> you'd benefit from going into a more automatic mode. So I think you're probably you're probably set up more for doing the action. You've got it all <clears throat> geared in towards that. And then we get to this shot and you've now you've got your settings aren't quite right, but you're trying to get people at the end. So it ends up being kind of a kind of an iffy one. Yeah, it was um, a surprise. It was like, can you take pictures quickly? And then it was like, uh, yeah, okay, go, boom, boom. So you're right, no time to Yeah, look it happens. Yeah. You know, so maybe when the action is all over, you you switch across to a more automatic mode, you know, a shutter priority or an aperture priority, and then you're a little bit more, you're ready to go with that. Yeah. One thing you could do is you could use the, um, the custom function C123, and you could yeah. set it up and say, C1 will be my action shots in the gym, C2 will be my, you know, family shots afterwards and C3 will be, you know, what have you at the end. So absolutely. Yeah. Use those features. So I, I, a couple of these, I've, I've modified a little bit to show you a couple of things. So, um, you know, I took this one and I said, well, what would, what would I do to enhance this one? It's hard with the JPEG image. So sure. just keep that in mind. But what I did was I took it from this, oops, too far. So from this to this, I hope that comes across well and over the zoom, yeah, I'm not yeah. sure, but um, when something is slightly overexposed like that, what I often try and employ is I use um, a dehaze function. So dehaze is one of the sliders in Lightroom. And what it does is it, it, it's intended really for like a landscape photo. If you've got like that hazy mist in the, in the image, you can use dehaze to take some of that haze down and bring back some of that contrast of the trees and things. It does a nice job on people too, though. Oh, yeah. uh, it gives kind of like that mid-range contrast. Whereas if you use the contrast slider, it adjusts everything top to bottom. Dehaze is going to keep it more in that mid-range and more affect, you know, sort of the the skin tones, the clothing, um, the skies, things like that. Uh, and it has kind of a nice look. The let me see. Yep. So that said, um, the shot of Niagara Falls you sent along as well. That's another one where I looked at it and I thought to myself, it's kind of flat. Yeah. Not a lot of, there's not a lot of contrast that, you know, it's not, things aren't jumping out at me necessarily. And landscapes are one where you really can, you can push the sliders farther than you probably should because you aren't affecting skin tones. You aren't affecting the way someone looks necessarily. So I took this one and I kind of played around with it. Um, 
and I ended up bringing it to this. So if you want to see the settings I applied on this, so I brought the contrast up a little bit, highlights down, shadows up. Um, I gave it a 21 of dehaze and I boosted the vibrance. So took it, you know, and just gave it some more punch. Now I'm not 100% sure I'm happy with the outcome. And I think some of that just is because we're working from a JPEG. Yeah. Um, like the sky to me doesn't feel right. It's got too much of a, I don't know, too much of that blue in there. So I might be tempted in a case like this to then put in like a, a gradient maybe and take some of that dehazing out because that's making probably the biggest difference in the sky. If I take that back to zero, oh, boy. back up yeah. to 20, you know, you can see that change there. Yep. So, you know, I might take that and, and then take that dehaze down to 10 or so using a, a, a gradient, but um, just something to think about. Absolutely. Um, so the other two that you sent along um, that I wanted to touch on were these two. Um, these are fascinating pictures. They, I, so it's real neon, right? Yeah, this is from the, uh, what's it called? Corel Museum in New York. Oh, uh, Corning? Corning, Cor yeah, Corning, sorry. Corning, Corning, okay, Corning Museum of Glass. Yeah, yeah exactly. it's just a, such an interesting mix of items. Yeah. Um, and there was, you sent two of them here. Let me, let me go back to here and get this out of the way. I'm going to put the two of them up side by side. Um, just a very interesting mix of, of things. And, uh, you know, sort of this, this, um, this type of photography is always fun. I mean, it helps you relive sort of what you'd seen and what you were, you were doing there. Um, in both cases, I looked at them though, and I said, I think, I think the one on the left with the neon, I think needs some more punch. Oh, yeah. And the one on the right, I think is a little overexposed. So I would take this back again to don't need, don't, you don't need to be on manual all the time. <laughs> but um, yeah, so just to give you an idea, I'm sorry, go ahead. I'm, I'm just, I'm learning now. Yeah, absolutely. So I took this one and again, using similar techniques, I brought up the shadows, I brought down the highlights, added a little dehaze, um, a little bit of vibrance. I took this one from this and brought it to that. Oh, geez. So, oh, yeah. so if I come here and close this down. So here's the before, is it doing it for me? Come on now. Oh wait, I'm on the wrong one. That's why it's not working. It's not working there either. Before and after anyway. So kind of a lot more gray here. And then we just sort of brought that up a little bit, made it a little bit warmer. Um, with this other one, again, because it's a little little blown out in the highlights, yeah. I brought those highlights down some. Now it, it made that background show up a little bit more, which I don't like. And I probably want to do a crop or something. So I took out that gradient change at the top but it gives it a little bit more punch, a little bit more bite. And again, you can see really, what did I do with this one? All I did was I just yes. cranked dehaze up to 57. So it's kind of my, my magic sauce with a lot of these shots. I'll, I'll, would, I'll work with that dehaze slider, especially with something like this where there's not skin to worry about. If you look at, uh, let's, let's take these lovely ladies here. If I take these two and I put their dehaze to 57, it does not do good things to them. Right. So you want to want to be careful with it with that. But even then, I'll use dehaze to some extent, maybe a, a 10 or, or 15 on action sport shots. And it just gives it a little bit of that gritty punch that you want in those images. Nice. So for the ones at the um, the museum, should I have shot them in aperture priority or sh or shutter priority instead of manual, in your opinion? Um, I would probably, in that case there, um, did you have a tripod? No. Okay. No. So handheld in there, I'm going to guess the light was kind of low, lower than it should be. So you're probably going to end up having to shoot slower than you want. Let's see what we had here. Um, so you shot, well, you shot at 1 200th, F4.5. Um, so the ISO was fairly high at 1250. Yeah. So 
I would probably, in this case, I'd probably go for aperture priority. I think that the creativity of the depth of field is going to be the most important thing. Um, if you're handheld and you've got, you know, what you were using, what lens here, you had the 24 to 70. So that's not image stabilized. So that is a little scary if you start taking that and running it too slow on the shutter speed, you'll start to get some some shake in that in that image. Um, but I, I'd be tempted to go aperture priority and as long as I wasn't getting too slow on the shutter. Um, you know, at 34 millimeters, you should theoretically be able to shoot down to, you know, about, you know, well, 1 34th of a second, which is not really a thing, but, um, you know, you should be able to shoot that pretty slow and still be okay handheld. Um, but, you know, just keep that in mind, just watch that shutter speed. So I'd go to, I'd go to aperture priority in this case, I'd probably shoot something like this at about five, six, just to make sure I get, you know, the things in the background in focus too. You can see it gets, it gets a little soft in the back yeah. um, at four or five and uh, yeah, auto ISO and, and it'd be good. Perfect. Okay. All right, so we got a few more minutes here. What what else you got for me? What other questions? Lighting has always been my. I have a big shoot coming up on Saturday at my daughter's gymnastics, and just got to figure out lighting. I mean, I bought I bought flashes, and I have umbrellas, and I have soft boxes. How do you know where's the best time to use a soft box versus umbrella? How do you know you know where to put these things? That's my that's my. Uh, so, Scary. yeah, no, it's, <laughs> I don't want to get there and mess it up, but you know, I want yeah. to so hey, let me, let me show you something I got hidden away back here. Pay no attention to that man behind the camera. <laughs> <laughs> okay, behind the curtain, I guess it was. Um, yeah. All right, I'm going to show you. I'm going to show you a little secret. This guy right here. So this is literally a foam head that I got from uh, Amazon. I think it was eight dollars. Right. So what's interesting about a foam head is they don't complain when you take a million pictures of them. <laughs> So if you are working with a light source and you want to see how it's going to look on a person, you can really easily see on this light source, let me stop the share here so you can see it better, what it's going to look like. As I move the light to a different position, if I want it lower, I want it higher, you can see all the changes. I yeah. highly recommend a foam head. <laughs> Um, and link then you can experiment and take pictures and see, is it better to have the light higher, even, lower, how far around I want it to go. Now, this is not going to help you for this weekend right? because it's not going to be here in time. But I think you should get one for experimentation. Now, I'm going to give you the, the short answer to, to your, your question, basically, which is you're shooting girls, right? Yeah. It's a gymnastic shoot. Girls will always want to be shot with the most flattering light you can do, you can have. So if I look at this light source here, so this is a three foot by four foot soft box. It's a pretty flattering light source. It, it has a nice fall off across the head, across the cheek. Um, you know, the shadows are not super harsh. Now, if I have a more harsh light source, like my phone, yeah. Okay. Yeah. It's a much more harsh cut off. It's, it's not a flattering light. So really the key is going to be for you to have the largest light source that you can have. Um, and in your case, I believe that would be your soft box. So I would have, I would have your soft box as the main, and then you can use your umbrellas on your fill lights. Again, to be flattering, you want to have as even of a light as possible. So what I would be looking at doing would be if I have my subject, I would put that softbox fairly close. All right. So 
again, this, this is a, the closer I get to it, the harsher the shadow gets, I mean, or the more fall off you get, excuse me. Yep. It gets more and more even the farther away I get, okay? Right. So kind of even light for girls would be appreciated. So I would, in this case, I'm about two feet away, two and a half feet away from it. For a guy, I'm gonna bring it in and be closer. This is about a foot away. Mm -hmm. So two, two and a half feet away with your largest soft box and illuminate them from this side and then come at from the opposite side with some fill to get the hair light or even from both sides in the back for that hair light. And um, behind, from, and from the, obviously three feet from behind, six feet from behind. So in the, in the back, back it won't matter back, so much. Back, okay. Yeah, you can be farther back in the, in the back and it's okay. A, a more hard light on a hair light or things like that won't be, won't be offensive. It's that light on the face that's going to be more important. So for your main, you're going to use your, your soft box, your biggest light that you're going to meter that in. You have the light meter. You're going to meter that in for the proper exposure for where they're going to be. And then the back lights, uh, you know, so if this, if this one we measure, we're going to shoot at F8, let's say, I go F8 on this, I'd probably go 5.6 on lights that are coming from behind. So a little bit less, but still fairly intense. So let me ask you, so we have one main light, the big 48 inch uh, softbox to my left, for example, at mm -hmm. F8. Another one and, and one, another one on my right, on my right side or not necessarily? Um, depends Again, on, on, depends on, on, on the angle. Yeah. 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 Um, if you're going to be more off to the side with your main light, you may want to fill from this side as well. Okay. If you're going to be more towards the center, then you're probably okay with just the one. Um, so let me show you another example shot here really quick. So we are going back over here. I wanted to show you this one. So this shot is, it's a three light setup. There is a large soft box on either side in the front. So, you know, just, just like yours, but they're at approximately F8 on one side and about F4 on the other. So you can see on, as you're looking at her on the right-hand side, that's where it's nice and bright. There's yeah. more of a shadow, more of a fall off on the left-hand side. But behind her on the left is a, is a strip box or you could use an umbrella for that either way. And that's actually at F8 as well. So that's very bright in the back to, And that's what gives that illumination down the side of her cheek and down the side of her hair. And it gives yep. that nice separation from the background um, and gives this really nice kind of wrap around nice looking light. So oh. that's, that's a, nice, a nice look. Um, this is one that we typically do for headshots, um, but it has that, that nice separation because I've got that nice bright edge that runs down the side and it even comes across like on the shoulder and things like that. So it, kind of cuts them out from the background and gives it a nice look. And the beauty um, dish is at the same height as the head or is it coming up from the bottom? Uh, so in this case, because she has glasses, I'm actually fairly high. I'm coming mm. down like this. So I don't have any sort of reflection back at the camera. Right. Yeah, if I don't see any flesh or anything in the glasses, which is awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so it's all about angle of incidence is the angle of reflection. So I can actually, I can simulate that a little bit for you right here. Let me close screen sharing so you can see it a little bit better. Yep. So with this light, it's a harsh light, it's up here. You're not seeing it in the glasses. The more that I come down, it's gonna yep. right there. So it's reflecting directly off the glasses and then directly into the camera. Um, so I can fix that by either coming up or like if I'm horizontal like this, and fix that by coming out to the side. And so the more out to the side I go, that's gonna work. So the, the only risk with that is if I come too far to the side, now I've got dark shadows and things right. like that. So oh, you're better off to come a right. little bit out, a little bit up, and that will, that will usually overcome that. Beautiful. And get a foam head. So that wasn't too bad. I only asked you to buy three things today and you already had one of them, so. <laughs> you have to use them, right? <laughs> yeah. So, Emma, Emma, would you recommend using them for the gymnastics? 
go there and use the uh, the gray you know, the gray card. Right, set the custom white balance. Use the color checker. Is that saying I should be doing every time I shoot now? So I would use the gray card. So you're shooting raw, so you can always do it later. Right. I would shoot a picture of the gray card anytime the lighting is is abnormal, it's strange, like in a gym, uh, maybe under fluorescence. Um, you know, maybe if it's uh, like some, you know, a situation that's not sort of your standard run of the mill that the that the camera is going to easily pick up on a proper white balance. Um, a tungsten gym lit is is really a rough thing to to accommodate with the camera. It just really struggles with that. So I would shoot the gray card because it just takes a second. Right. Walk into a gym. You walk into a new scenario. Walk into a cafeteria. Shoot the gray card, and then you have it in your back pocket in case you need it. Then when you come back to the computer later, use that gray card as a custom white balance and just copy that across all of them. Um, you don't necessarily have to go into your camera and do it every single time, unless you're going to shoot JPEG. Then I would then I would do that, but you're not doing that, so we're good. <laughs> so, I went, so I went to I went to the gym and they have tungsten and fluorescence. Is that going to screw me up? That's where the, the white card is going to come in handy. Okay. Right. Yeah, it's, it, it's very like it's very likely lit. I mean, it's just, it's very likely lit. Does that make a difference? Well, the camera to the camera doesn't care. It still sees two sources of lights. It's going to see the two. It's and it, to some extent, at that point, there's no way to really accommodate it. You just have to kind of, um, you know, figure out what your main spot is, or like some, sometimes you'll find if I'm going to be in this position in the gym because the action is there then I can realize, well, I had mostly tungsten lighting them. My background may look weird, but at least if my subject, if my, my key subject is looking correct, then it's gonna be about the best you can do uh, without serious Photoshop work to try and change it after the fact. Right, perfect. Well, be a lot more confident, I'll be honest. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, I think we're gonna wrap up there. Um, so hopefully that was helpful for you. And uh, sure. we will uh, be doing another one of these soon, I think. So Good. I'm going to hit stop here and uh, we will talk to you later. Thank you very much. Thank you.